This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The Beatles, growing up in Hollywood and transcendental meditation. Prudence Farrow Bruns on this edition of Conversations. By any definition, Prudence Farrow Bruns has lived a fascinating and intriguing life. She grew up in Hollywood, the daughter of actress Maureen O'Sullivan, famous for playing Jane in the Tarzan movies, and film director John Farrow. Her sister is actress Mia Farrow. But for Prudence, her passions were a world away in India, where she would study and learn transcendental meditation from the Maharishi. Her enthusiasm for meditation was such that it inspired John Lennon to write a song about her. Yes, she's that Prudence. Dear Prudence, from the 1968 Beatles White Album. Prudence Farrell Bruns is an expert and respected teacher in the practice of meditation. She's an accomplished film producer, speaker, and author. Her memoir is entitled Dear Prudence, the story behind the song. We welcome Prudence Farrell Bruns to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. What Thank a fascinating you. life you've lived. <laughs> I enjoyed reading through the book. Tell me a little bit about that, the story behind the song. What is the story behind the song? That's a good question. Uh, the, the book ends in India with the song being written, but the story behind it is what brought me to India. And it's actually the story of a lot of people my age, uh, sort of a generation we call the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it kind of explains... Uh, what took place during that time from a perspective that isn't usually addressed. I mean, we see it in terms of the Vietnam War, in terms of the music, and the different things that went on, but not in terms of sort of the crisis that a lot of us went through personally. Whether, you know, people were drafted into a war that nobody quite understood, mm -hmm. <laughs> there were no heroes, or whether, you know, um, it was you know, the introduction of LSD and hallucinogenics, which brought a lot of um, confusion to our, our coming of age, or whether it was because of uh, sort of a tsunami of all of those things with the war and with, uh, we watched as we came of age, our president be shot before our eyes, who represented hope. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of us, um, including the Beatles, that felt the need to turn inward to find more than our society or world was offering. We were on the precipice of what we felt, our culture felt, could be a third world war. Mm. And, you know, there we had the H-bomb. We had gone through the Bay of Pigs, which was uh, very frightening. You know, I had a, my father built a a whole bomb shelter under a house mm. <laughs> and stocked it for a year. Oh, wow. uh, so there were a lot of things that made us uh, question what it meant to be an adult and what way, did, what direction did we want to take the world. And that if we took it in the way that it had been going with the technology we had then, which was the H-bomb, uh, that it, we wouldn't survive. So there was a, a real push to try and, you know, find a solution to our world and to us as human beings and as individuals. So it was kind of an identity crisis a lot of people went through in their own way, but it was very much collective as well. When did you first learn about Transcendental Meditation? That's a good question. Um, I first learned about it from a friend of my brother's um, who had been to India. In fact, he took his, he lived in the same neighborhood as we did in, in Los Angeles. And so he took all of his college money, uh, somehow got hold of it, <laughs> and went off to India. And he was first with a woman uh, uh, who was considered a great saint of the 20th century named Ananda Mai Ma. And then he spent six months with her, and she said, you should go study under this particular um, great yogi named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He's really for the West. He understands the Western mind. 
And so he went there and he had just come back and that's when I met him and he was telling me about meditation. But I had, when I was 15, my father died mm -hmm. and I had my first very profound spiritual experience. And so I was looking for a deeper meaning to life in a spiritual way. And I had read Siddhartha and about Buddha, and, and I, I felt that the real answers were inside. And I was looking for meditation when he came along. And the simplicity that he described in the meditation he described, because I've been doing all different kinds of meditation and reading about them, the simplicity that where he said, deep inside of all of us is a part of the mind that we can tap into. It's silent, it's peaceful, it's creative, and it brings joy and peace to the, to the whole being. It, and we can tap into that very easily and then bring it into our life. So when I heard him say that, on some you know, very obvious level to me, I, I found myself saying, this is, this is it, this is what I've been looking for. Because it was so simple, and direct, and that's all I wanted. I didn't. I didn't really want to do the practice of meditation. I wanted to get what meditation could give you, and this seemed to be a very direct way to get it. What is transcendental meditation? Good question. Transcendental meditation comes out of the yoga tradition. The yoga tradition in India is very, very old. We don't know how old it is because. They have um, Harap in Harappa, which was you know 2700 BC, a seal of somebody sitting in the full lotus, obviously meditating. So we don't know how old it is, but it's a tradition of self improvement, of making developing your your potential from the inside out, deepening the mind, connecting with the deepest part of the mind so that you can stabilize it and bring that influence into your life because the mind, like the roots of the tree, it affects everything. And so if you can you know, stabilize that and deepen it, then you're less vulnerable, you're, more, you're feeling more um, connected, more centered, and that allows you to be stronger and it affects all everything, relationships, achievements, all of that. Well, how do you do that? How do you meditate? Well, that's a good question, too. <laughs> um, it was always taught. So you don't, it's like a martial art. I mean, you don't, um, you can't get it from reading a book. Mm -hmm. You really have to be instructed. And that's what I, when I went to India, I, I had been instructed at UCLA. They had a course in 1966, the summer of 66 that I took. And, um, and I've, I found that it was, in fact, what I was looking for. And the next step was to study with the person who brought this out. You know, he knew all about it. He knew what, what we were tapping into, what, what the long-term results, you know, uh, just the whole gamut. And so I wanted to study with him and um, went to India as a result of that. But um, it, it's a very, it, you have to be taught because it's something you do. And so you're guided. It's very simple because the mind itself, its nature is to always move towards more. And when it's pointed in the right direction inward, it will move in that direction and it will find that part of itself that's silent. And that's sort of its foundation. And once you tap into that, you realize that what we've been calling our mind, busy, our emotions, our perceptions, all of that, it's lacking a foundation. And that when you can bring the foundation in, it balances it. It helps that busy mind have a kind of gravitas to it so that it's more stable, it's deeper and less reactive. And so it's, it's a very important part of the mind that we're neglecting and maybe we just haven't had a way to get to it, but now that this technique is available we can all get to it. It's necessary and, um, 
once you find that part of your mind and get access to it, it's, it's remarkable how it will affect everything else because the mind plays such a central role in our decisions, you know, in our reactions, and even the goals we set or see. So it's very, very important. It's just been lacking. It's sort of like somebody being made wise. Mm -hmm. You know, wise people have more foresight. They don't run on, you know, react to, uh, to everything. And that's what deepening your mind and stabilizing it, connecting it with its own foundation does. We call that foundation ourselves. We call it our self, our center. But it's too abstract for us at this point. We can get it. And if we get it, we will become better, stronger people and l more able to embrace the differences around us because, quite frankly, our world will continue to s get smaller but also grow. We're going to have to accept difference, you know, that people are going to be different from us. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, you can't be threatened. Right. And this is about making it so you're you're strong enough to be able to to see difference, and it won't threaten you. Once you start meditating, how long does it take a person who's never done Good that? Good question to, again. To, to, well, to, to 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 start seeing effects or start feeling differently, is that right away? Right away. Because what you do is you tap into that deepest part of your mind. If you look at the mind like a body of water, like the Gulf of Mexico, large, the surface is active. But as you go deeper, it becomes less active, and the foundation can be very still. So if you think of the mind there, what you do when you transcend, which is a word that doesn't mean much to most of us. It didn't to me. I didn't know what they were talking about. But it means you go deep inside, and you sort of put an anchor there, at that deepest part, that silent foundation. And then you continue to move between the two. So right now we're relegated to the surface part of the mind. That's all we know. But there's this other part. And once you find it, then you move between the two. When you're transcending, you go to that deepest part, you come out, you go to that deepest part, you come out. And what that does is it starts to develop a relationship for the mind where it starts to identify or work from or come from that deeper part, that silent part, so that that's its place of operation rather than the busy, you know, constantly changing reaction to this, that kind of mind. So the other's still there. But you, the part of you that can go between the two starts to operate from its base rather than from the other. That gives you more control over the other, meaning that you can decide if you're going to react that way or not because you're coming from a silent place rather than from a busy place. You also, how you define yourself changes. You start to see yourself as a healthier person rather than a constant changing, emotional. That's your stresses a lot of the time, whereas you have this sense of being centered in yourself, operating from the zone. That kind of thing starts to happen from, for you. And it just happens naturally by associating with that deeper part of the mind. Tell me what it was like studying in India, and obviously the Beatles were there. What was that experience like? It was like? extraordinary, because back then, India was very far away. You know, you didn't have computers, right. and even telephones didn't really work. Right. So leaving my world and going there, it was so exotic. I mean, people were riding camels in the street and elephants, and they all dressed differently. You know, they were in these long, beautiful, uh, long saris, and the men were in what they call pajamas. That's where we got the word pajama from. Most of them were not dressed in Western clothes. The most profound was when I got off the plane, the sense of time. I never knew that time could be relative until that moment. Time was different there. They were still, even though I was in the city, they were still 
primarily an agricultural country. So even in the cities, you had, you know, you had cows, you had goats, you had chickens, you had everything, pigs, everything. But, um, but the sense of time was very, very different. Nobody ran by the clock. You would never say something to somebody like, uh, meet me at 1210. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. You might say, well, when the sun starts to go down, but there's no, there was no sense of like, you've got to be places at a certain time. That, that, that didn't work there. It, it was like being literally, like being put back in a time machine to the Middle Ages. It really blew my mind, as they say. It was an amazing experience. I and mean, we've talked about traveling affecting people because you see different mentalities and ways of looking at the world and things. But this was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was totally different. And uh, it was quite an experience. It almost frightened me. But then we went from this exotic place where people were riding camels, I mean, uh, to, and horses were drawing things. I mean, there were some cars, but they were not, you know, the major thing. But then going into the jungles in India, because the land where the course was given was up on a hill in a jungle reserve that overlooked the Ganges as it comes out of the Himalayas. Beautiful, spectacular, but it was the jungle. And so it was, it was very, um, it was just the experience was, was completely cha life-changing. What was it like being there with the Beatles, and did you have any idea John Lennon was going to write the song about you? No, I had no idea. Um, well, see, I had been around famous people right. because my father made movies with John Wayne and things. And I, one of the things I had learned was that it was disappointing to meet famous people if you cared. When I was seven years old, my mother, I, I was wild about an opera star. And she had me spend my seventh birthday with him and his family. And it was, he was drinking all the time, and he was angry. And it was such a disappointment. Mm. I was so shocked. Here's this guy who sang, it was just heavenly, his, his voice. And in real life, he was really a horrible, what I thought was a horrible person. And um, it just went downhill from that, <laughs> meeting famous people. And uh, I didn't want to meet the Beatles yeah. for that reason. Yeah. I just didn't, because I actually liked their music. I liked what they were saying. And they were, the Beatles were like Steve Jobs was for us. If you remember when he would come out with a I, iPhone the, or the first, you know, different iPod and things iPod. of that nature. I mean, it was amazing. Right. It was phenomenal. And we'd be so excited when you come with the next. Well, the Beatles' music was like that. When their music came out, it was maybe a hundred times more than that. Everyone was going through the same collective experience. And their music was the voice to that. So when they came out with an album, we all, everybody would come and just sit around it and listen. It was a p very powerful kind of thing. So to meet the Beatles, I didn't want to meet them. You know, I didn't want to meet people who were full of themselves. Right. You know, I'd had enough of that, <laughs> which you meet a lot in Hollywood. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised they were not like they that. They weren't that way. They were one of the rare people that were not like that. All of them. You know, all of them were not like that. There was one point where Mari, she said to them, we'll give you your own dining area so that you have your privacy. And they said, no, we don't want that. We want to be treated like everybody else. And uh, so they were very different than most of the famous people I met. Interesting. When did you find out about the song? I found out about it in India. It was at a lecture, and my glasses had broken. Um, in India, so I couldn't see. I, I now had, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I've had surgery where the eyes, uh, no, no, laser cataract. Surgery. No, oh, cataract. Oh, cataracts. Okay. So I can see now without my glasses. Okay. But I was very nearsighted, like 950 or minus 950 or whatever, really nearsighted. 
So uh, I, I learned to function uh, without glasses somehow or other. You know, girls that wear glasses never get past this kind of thing. So I would kind of feel my way. And we were at this, in the lecture hall, there were maybe 60 of us. And um, they were leaving suddenly. They're, that's, I don't know what was going on, but they had to leave suddenly. And um, George was trying to get my attention. So he was standing over there, and I was in the lecture hall. But I couldn't see. And people said, George is there. He's trying to tell you something. But I knew that if I looked, I wouldn't be able to see him. So I pretended as though I didn't hear. And then he told somebody, you know, tell Prudence that we've written a song for her. He didn't say it was John had. He said, we've written a song for her. Um, and we wanted to say goodbye. And, and so I got that message through people. But I couldn't, if I'd have walked over, I would have stumbled on people. That's how bad my eyes were. It was horrible. <laughs> and I didn't want to have to go through that. So I just pretended and ignored. That was one of the ways I dealt with things. You know, like a boy, somebody would say, that guy's looking at you. Well, I couldn't see if he was looking or not. So I, ignore you know um so that was how i found out speaking of your life and, and you mentioned you know meeting famous people and growing up in hollywood i want to put up a couple of pictures and just have sure. you talk about them because sure. uh, your book talks about much of what um you know it was like growing up in yes. hollywood and you mentioned john wayne i enjoyed the part in there where yeah. you talked about when you first met john yes. wayne <laughs> so you want to tell that real quick yeah just... well john went his uh it was a movie my father was making and there was, they have all these seats for all the right. stars and the director. And there was one big giant leather wood seat, much taller than any of the other seats. And I guess just by nature, I was curious. I couldn't resist this. So I went and climbed up on this big seat and looked over all the other seats that were facing the stage. And um, as I sat there, this... John Wayne came up behind me and he said, well, partner, you know, <laughs> somebody's sitting in my chair. And I turned around and he was very tall and he had that deep voice. And it was my first real experience of man versus woman. It was like, whoa, there is something to being a man, you know, very, very nice. You like that? Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that's great. And then he, he lifted me up and, you know, did things. So it was, it, he, was a, he was a big hero. But I saw him years later and I was disappointed because he unfortunately had started drinking a lot, I think. Mm. Let me show a couple of pictures here. I think we have a picture of your mom and dad, perhaps. And of course, uh, there that we go. That is them when they were very young. There are very few pictures of them that early, and that's why I chose that picture. Online, you can find pictures of them, you know, right. after they're married. But this was a very early picture. It could have been right after their wedding or something, but it's a very early picture. Was your dad, as you said, was a director and yes, your mom both was an actress? Yes, both my parents, I'm first generation American. So both my parents came and left their families. None of their families left. My mother was from Ireland and um, her family, none of her family left. So all my cousins, everybody's still there. And same with my father, he's from Australia. Mm. And he had come, he had left home at 15 and found his way to Hollywood eventually and made his way into uh, becoming a movie director. So Wonderful. I think we, uh, I think we may have a couple more of, of your home in Beverly Hills, perhaps, with your uh, siblings that we were going to show just real quick. Um, or maybe not. But, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, yes, that's, that's by our swimming pool. And uh, my sister Mia, who's well-known, is kind of in the center. I'm the one with the dark hair with my mouth open. My brother Johnny on the side of me. Patrick, my mother, going to the right. My sister Steffi, the baby. And Michael, the oldest uh, of our siblings. And he was killed when he was 19 mm -hmm. in an airplane crash. We have about three minutes left. Uh, Prudence, tell me what is on your agenda in the coming years. Well, oh, there's your family right there's there. There's my family, yeah. Um, grandchildren and children, three children and uh, four grandchildren. Um, I am pretty much retired down in 
northwest Florida in the Seagrove Beach Seaside Area 30A. And uh, I teach TM. And I come here sometimes, and I, I've you know, met a wonderful group of people. Over the years, I've taught here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I mainly now I want to give back. And so teaching TM, I think, is uh, it's such a powerful technique for any of us. And I think it's a part of the mind that we've neglected for whatever reasons. Our culture hasn't gone there. But I think it's something, it's timely now, it's time. It helps with stress mm. in an amazing way because that when the mind becomes quiet and rested in the way it does, then the body follows. So we get tremendous uh, relief from stress, which is a major problem for most of us nowadays. Yeah, and of course stress can cause health problems to go with it. And family problems, yeah. divorce, and, and world problems. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on ourselves a little bit. We've got great technology, but it's going to do us no good if we don't start working on ourselves. So it's time, and I'm going to devote the rest of my life to that. If people want to follow you and learn what you're doing and get some insight on uh, Transcendental Meditation, where can they go? Well, there's tm.org, T for Transcendental, M for Meditation.org. They can get in touch with me through that. I have a website, which is Prudence Farrow, F-A-R-R-O-W dot com. Okay. So either one. Um, I'll, I'll direct them to the TM teaching, but the TM.org will connect them with me in this area. Prudence Farrow Bruns. The name of her book is Dear Prudence, the story behind the song. And yes, indeed, she is that Prudence. Thank you so very much. What Thank a pleasure you. to talk to you. Thank you for, for listening. You are so welcome. Yeah. All the best to you. You too. Thank you. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. You can also find us on YouTube, and we're on Facebook. And, of course, just feel free to Google Prudence, and you'll find out all kinds of great uh, information about her and what she has done in the past, as well as what she's going to be working on in the future, and also learn some about uh, some more about the Transcendental Meditation, which uh, is very fascinating, great conversation we've had here today. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take a wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company, and by viewers like you. Thank you.